All right, everyone, welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Ruth Griffith, and thank you for joining Snow Owl Libraries for Growing Groceries, Principles of Vegetable Gardening in the Pacific Northwest, presented by Jim Olson. So first, some housekeeping. Your mics are muted, so please use chat to ask questions. We'll use chat on our end to share links to any lists and websites mentioned today. After Jim's presentation, we'll have time for questions, and you're welcome to submit questions in chat at any time, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. If you'd like to turn on captions for this event, uh, we'll drop the instructions into the chat box. This event is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel with captions in a week or two. And so, time to introduce tonight's speaker. Jim Olson has been a gardener on and off since his elementary school years. After retirement, gardening came back onto the front burner and he joined the King County Master Gardener Program in 2013. Currently, he shows how to grow melons at the Master Gardener Bellevue Demo Garden. He is on the Growing Grocery Series leadership team and faculty, and he leads the Redmond Plant Advice Clinic. He has several leadership roles in King County Master Gardener Program and is the current president of the Master Gardener Foundation of King County, which is the fundraising part of the organization. At home, Jim grows berries, apples, many types of veggies and herbs and landscape plants, including natives. He has a special fondness for growing orchids too. So welcome, Jim. It's great to have you with us tonight. Great, thanks Ruth. Before I get started, I wanna say a little bit about the Master Gardener Program, why hopefully this is a, a little bit of a cred for what we're doing. The Master Pro Gardener Program began actually 50 years ago this year in King and, and Pierce County out of the Washington State University Extension Office in the Department of Agriculture. So Washington State University trains us and certifies us and we reapply every year to um, be able to give the best advice we can. So the program is organized by county, trains volunteers to provide advice and provides a multitude of resources for home gardeners, almost all of which are free. And this advice we provide is research-based and focused on environmentally friendly and sustainable gardening practice. So hopefully with that, um, I will practice what I preach as we start the presentation. So as, as we said, I'm Jim Olson, and here is my cover slide. And what I'd like to do is um, talk about the reasons to start, a, you might start a veggie garden and what, how we're gonna approach this. So any or all of these could apply to your interest in pursuing a vegetable garden or sustaining your, your gardening practice. Actually, before I do that, I'd like a little information. So I'm going to ask, launch a poll here. It'll pop up and there's one question. And if you guys would answer it, this will give me a little bit of information as to how to tailor this presentation. Okay, we're just about done and um, this is good information to know. So I'm going to share the results. And um, so essentially 50% are pretty new and 50% have some, some um, repetitions under the belt. So for the new people, Welcome to the perspective I'm going to provide for the people that have been at this more than um, three years. Hopefully, a review of the fundamentals and uh, some applications of the fundamentals will be um, beneficial for you. So anyway, back to the reasons to start a garden. You have the space, you have the time, you love good food, you want to take the challenge of sustainable and organic gardening, and you love to see delicious things. So this picture here is from one of our master gardeners. It's also on the um, 
of the faculty of the growing groceries. And this is her tomato and, and zucchini harvest from um, a couple of years ago to show you what's possible and the beauty that is garden. And these are all del delicious things. So again, the, the vantage point I'm gonna take is I'm gonna start at the um, top level and give you um, an overview of, of everything that's gonna be necessary to be successful in your garden. The focus is gonna be on taking actions that are preventive in nature, but also cover what happens if things go wrong and how, how to work for, with that. And the intention is, is to give you a complete view either before you start or to review how you're going about what you're doing. So we live in zone eight in Pacific Northwest and it says there, that means a low of 10 to 20 degrees. Yesterday, the min-max thermometer I use in my backyard said it was 18 at my place in Redmond. So that's pretty, that can be pretty cold and it affects on um, what we can grow and when we start it. So our area has a variety of microclimates due to the um, hilly and um, forested nature of, of our environment. Typically, for those people who are less gifted, you can have two short growing seasons for cool crops. You can grow um, hot, hot, I've grown all the hot weather crops here, cucumbers, tomatoes, uh, even eggplant, melons, and, and tomatoes. The other thing to remember from a mostly fertilizer standpoint is we have soils with a low pH, meaning it's acid, and that's because we get a lot of rain and it washes the carbon dioxide in the air mixed with rainwater, actually washes nitrogen out of the soil and creates an acid situation. And we're typically dry from June to September. What that looks like is this. So the thing to focus on here is that um, the, the trend that you see in July and August, we have the hottest, the hottest days and the least amount of rain in, in those times. So that's where, when we get into the middle part of the, what I'm gonna talk about, you'll see why that's such a challenge. And recognize that I live, um, like I said, in Redmond, this is at SeaTac, and these numbers are dramatically, excuse me, at Boeing Field, at SeaTac, the numbers are dramatically different, enough measurable differences that the, the temperatures are a little bit cooler at, at SeaTac, and in Redmond, I have hotter and cooler temperatures, both with more rain than either of these locations. So even though they're miles apart, they're dramatically different in the highs and lows and the rain that falls. The model that I'm going to use today is what I call the successes. And you start and begin with savor. So savor is the um, cognition that you want to have something fun to, you want the challenge of growing it and the uh, wonder of fresh, fresh, fresh produce. The first thing you want to consider is the site you have available. And I'll talk about the attributes of each of these in a second. The soil that that site has and its characteristics what species you want to grow. That means whether you want leafy greens or tomatoes or corn or whatever. Starting is what uh, is getting things underway. Sustain is probably the hardest part and savor is um, critical as well. So here are the key points that I'm going to talk about as I cover each of the S's. Again, this is a recipe for the veggie harvest, focusing on prevention with a side of cure. So the site should be full sun. By full sun in guard, the gardening world, that's six hours of direct sun a day. Typically, I would say in the 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. or 10 a.m. to uh, 4 p.m. window, that will be the ideal. Of course, more sun is better, but you can get essentially any vegetable in full sun with the six hours. The, the definition of soil is well draining and, and fertile, which means you have the right nutrients, Water goes in and, and, and moves around. Um, unfortunately, we have a, a challenge with that we'll talk about later in the types of soils that the glaciers of 10,000 years ago left for us. That when you choose species, you want to choose things you like, first of all, and then um, choose disease resistance and what will ripen in our climate in time. Starting, starting is critical in the sense that What's the right time of year? And what's the, in, in a number of cases, what's the right soil temperature to um, start your crop in? And sustain is mostly water and watch. 
as you saw in the hot days of July and August, lots of sun, little rain, water is critical. In fact, uh, in some cases, disease and pest issues are ultimately related to watering, either too much or too little. And then you watch for the signs of too much or too little. And savor, know what ripe is. And I have a, a sad story that I've uh, learned early on in the, um, growing melons about how important knowing what, what ripe is. I'll share that with you when we get to that point. To be successful, a gardener needs tools. And that's not just the tools you work the soil with, but I'm going to strongly recommend three, encourage, cajole, whatever, whatever I can do. And um, the first one is a gardening calendar. And I think the library will recommend a book that has a month by month gardening calendar. And this is what, what suits your fancy. The gardening calendar is to cause you to look ahead, ideally at the whole year and, and plan efforts, but at least to be able to look where you're at now and what's immediately ahead. There's all sorts of them from very detailed to concise. They are, and I've listed one there, the link there is for um, master gardeners in Portland and what grows well there. And you can get it for general gardening, for vegetables. So this is, this is a really valuable tool to have for planning and um, execution throughout the year. The biggest challenge with, oh, I'm gonna say the biggest challenge with getting started and getting underway is having the right soil. And a soil test um, is, is recommended in King, in King County, actually parts of King County and then other adjacent counties in the watershed that it makes up what's called the King Conservation District. Members of that district get one free soil test. I think it's Nahomish and Island counties for those members there or other, other people from other counties. There are places you can get soil tests. Some may be free, some may cost you a little bit money, but ultimately they're well worth it because they, they can point to uh, problems and I'll, I'll talk in some detail about what that is and what it means to you a little later so you know what to do. Um, the, uh, another key tool is a moisture meter. A soil moisture meter, um, $10 and up, lets you know if you're watering too little or too much. It's too, too many good gardeners practice looking at the top, top of the soil when you really need to go two to four inches, two to six inches down in the soil to get a really good look at your water profile. And consider a, a soil thermometer, especially if you grow hot weather crops. And by hot weather, I mean cucumbers, melons, tomatoes, they all benefit from knowing what the soil temperature is before you plant. Okay, so let's talk about um, this site first. The site is literally a container to an acre or whatever, whatever you have available. And every, again, every, what I'm going to talk about in, in this is going to cover all the options from whether you have uh, containers or a huge plot of land to grow on. As I mentioned before, sun is critical, a full sun, six hours a day. But if you have low light, there's some things you can do about that. And you can um, test, test that in a number of ways by starting with leafy greens, uh, the perennial vegetable asparagus, garlic, and leeks, if they grow well, move up, move up the light chain to beans, radishes, peas, and like that. So you, you, can, you can step into that, like if you live in an apartment or uh, like in my case, I have, what, when I moved into my house, there were two six foot dug firs in the background. Now they're 130 feet and they've altered what is full sun in my yard dramatically. Other things is keeping your garden, um, healthy, which means access to water. So it's easy to get water to it. It's got good, good drainage and defensible. By defensible, I mean critters that, um, in, in my case, I have a, a, a garden plot near a sidewalk and dogs walking up and down the sidewalk wouldn't know my garden from the sidewalk. So I've got to protect, protect it from them walking on it. The rabbits that are also here from noshing on it, Occasionally deer visiting, but they're not a real issue because there's better things for them to eat than my garden so far. Slugs, et cetera. So defensible means protected from, from things that would do your garden harm. So the next slide, these, these are um, to show you how 
much sun, little sun differences make a huge difference in your crop. So this is from a vegetable garden plot I have in my backyard. It gets full sun by the definition, but there's also a fence to the east side of that that's five feet above the raised bed level. The carrot on the far left was gr grown two and a half feet from the carrot on the far right. So just the difference in early in the season when the sun comes up over that fence, it hits the, the westernmost carrots first and then the easternmost most of the day. But once it gets a head start, then that western carrot starts to shade the eastern carrots. So the good news is, I have carrots no matter where I plant them, but you can see how something as little as you know two and a half feet apart, we're talking about, again, microclimates too, that this is um, a dramatic difference with light. So um, recommendation on, on layout, ideally you want to plant um, rows north to south, it gives, gives the most sun, least shading, and um, the bed should be wide enough so that you can maximize your space, but not so wide that you can't maintain them without stepping on them and compacting the soil. And that the um, pass wide enough to walk through. Um, in my case, I, mine is so I can bend down without knocking the rabbit fences down on either, either side. So I have two beds back to back and they're wide enough that I can squat down and I can reach into them but also squat down and um, maintain them without knocking the other fence or other plants down. So some examples of that, there's raised beds, as you can see in the upper right, mounded beds in the lower left and just plain flat ground. Any, anyone will work, each have their advantages and disadvantages and some of it's related to the soil characteristics, uh, water, Basically, does it hold water or is it a drier site that would help influence your decision? But as master gardeners, we're going to recommend raised beds give are the best option given a choice. If, if you can put raised beds in any fashion, there's a couple advantages for them. The first and foremost is in, in our climate with like last year, especially with the miserable May, June and almost into a little bit into early July, soil temperatures with the cool and wet. Raised beds give you the best chance of getting warm, warm soils earlier, which allows you to plant earlier. They tend to, they tend to drain better, so overwatering is not as much of a challenge. And again, um, well-drained soils also warm faster. When you, when you fertilize, the soil and nutrients are contained a little more cleanly and it's, um, you know, the fertilizers you do apply are more, are more strategically and economically applied. Same with, same with if you need pest controls, they're more strategically and um, economically applied. And then it also allows efficient use of garden space for de desired plants. There's a book I read very early in my gardening career because of the limitations in gardening space I had called Square Foot Gardening which gives a very good sequence of how to design a garden with plants typically occupying one or one and a half of the square foot um, areas within your garden space. But we're not only talking about beds in the soil. Containers are also an option. So you can see the, the left-hand picture is clearly, um, well, I can't clearly, but down in the, low, the lower right of that picture, there's a car. So that's on a second or third floor of a, condo or apartment. The upper right is um, also a raised, raised bed. And then something that I've been experimenting more with recently, um, again, for um, soil warmth and drainage, is uh, containers on top, of, on top of soil. And so there's multiple ways you can do that. The key guidance here is the bigger the pot, the better. And that's for both crop yield and maintenance. The smaller the pot, the more often it's going to um, need water. So for example, a thing to consider is which is gonna dry out first in, in your backyard? Um, saucer, uh, a saucer or a flat plate with water on it. it. Basically the small containers are the flat saucer, which is going to 
Plants are going to take water from it. It's going to evaporate quicker because there's not much of a reservoir. And so um, that's a consideration. Get the biggest pots you can. And it has all the benefits of a raised bed. Other things to consider for your site is to go vertical. And this is, again, a concept I learned first in square foot gardening, because if you take like peas, is it, uh, unless you get um, um, bush beans or bush peas, but um, cucumbers are an example, are spreading, spreading vegetables. The more you can grow up, the more vegetables you can grow. And there's all sorts of elegant um, artistic or functional ways of, of going vertical. And you can even put vertical things on containers to, um, for ease of maintenance and harvesting. So consider growing, going vertical when you can. And now we're going to get into the nitty gritty. The um, and nitty gritty being soil, of course. And um, the ideal blend of garden soil is minerals consisting of clay, salt, and sand, uh, silt, and sand, organic matter, composted, living, and decaying, and pores which allow the mo water movement and and air pockets. So I'm going to give a, a little bit of math here. The ideal minerals would typically you'd want to make up 50, almost 50% 50 of your soil mix. Organic matter between five and 10% of your soil mix. And the soil test will tell you this kind of stuff. And pores making up almost the other 50% because roots to be healthy need the minerals that, the mineral nutrients, they need the, the nutrients from the, the composted and decaying organic matter. And vitally important is the water to move it all around, but the air pockets, because roots need air to, to survive and thrive. And the key nutrients to add for gardening are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And almost every fertilizer you see on the market is a blend of these three in ingredients. So let's talk a little uh, very basically about um, soil, soil additions and amendments. In nature, um, and not, not us, plants will have succeeding generations and the, the older generation will become food for the newer generation. A classic example for that, not in a gardening sense, but in a, a system of life is I live near Marymore Park and there's an area which they call a, um, I got to, I can't remember the name right off the top of my head, but it, it, it progresses from the lake to um, lake of uh, water, water tolerant plants to uh, the trees that su survive in, in moisture transition, it's transition zone. And all those, when all those plants die, they become fertilizer for the next generation and so on and so on and so on. When we garden, we typically take the old, and for, and for good reasons, take the old plants off and um, in some cases compost them and put them back, but those plants deplete the soil. And um, nature, nature allows what grows there in the, with the fertilizer available. We want to choose our plants, which means we may need to amend the soil. So again, the first choice, which I mentioned as a recommendation, is to have a soil test completed and follow the amendment results. And I'll show you what one looks like in a second. The other choices, the, um, it'll work and, and it's an easy, easy, much easier way to go is to um, apply six to seven pounds of a organic fertilizer and first and it says five, five, five. Those correspond to the percent of that available material in the fertilizer. So five, the first five is 5% nitrogen and 5% phosphorus and 5% potassium um, in that fertilizer. And you can get them in three, 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 four, 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 something like that. Anything more than that is probably not an organic fertilizer. It's a chemical fertilizer. That's say chemical fertilizers are bad. Um, they, they can be good. Again, our recommend a recommendation is to is to go organic for a number of reasons. But that that's for a thousand square feet. So know how much measure your garden space and do the math. Make sure you add the right amount of fertilizer if you go this method to your garden. Another option, and Territorial Seed does a good job of this, is they tell you how much um, of a, a organic fertilizer to add per plant or per row. 
as an example, typically to plant a, a pepper plant, which is a high feeder or a tomato plant, they suggest adding up to a half a cup of the fertilizer in the, within the immediate rooting area of, of those plants. And then another good practice for a number of reasons for new beds is to add one to three inches of compost and existing beds less. Um, and, we'll talk, and I'll mention here the difference between compost and, and mulch. All compost actually acts as a mulch early on, but it's more readily available to decay where mulches typically are less decayed and take longer to do that, but ultimately have a number of positive benefits for the soil in terms of weed, weed suppression, soil temperature maintenance, and water maintenance of the soil. In King County and King Conservation, I mentioned this earlier that, and I've taken advantage of their free service, but I get one, you get one per one per lifetime at this point, is they give you the instructions as to how to prepare a sample, when, to, when and where to send it, and if there's a fee required, how to do that. But, the, but that is their reason for doing this and offering them free for um, gardening residents is to protect the, the lakes and rivers we have because without knowing it, um, too many people add too much fertilizer and, and there's like a dog waste and stuff like that getting into the water with too much phosphorus. So the tendency is if a little's good, a lot's better. Well, no, having your soil test tells you what's just right. Not, and I'll, I'll show you some warts in, on, on my soil in a second here. Um, but recognize their interest is that it's, it's, cheaper to, it's cheaper and healthier to keep excessive nutrients out of the water than it is to clean it up later. So they offer the service as kind of a, a prevention and guidance for home gardeners to do the right thing right off the bat. A win for the gardener is, is getting, getting good information on how to grow the best plants. The win for the county, and the conservation district, is optimum water, temp optimum water quality for our fish and other and recreational purposes. So this is going to be a little hard to read, and I'm going to pause on this in, in a second. I don't know if you can see my cursor here. But when I became a master gardener, I was, before I became a master gardener, I was using what sometimes is referred to as the dynamite effect. If a little's good, a lot's better. And as I said earlier, organic matter, the first bar there, ideally is five to 10%. In this bed, I added compost up the, um, as much as I had available, and you can see it's listed at almost 30%. That's too much and it leads to some problems with compaction and nutrient availability. So I've been, I haven't added much compost to that lately. Next one, phosphorus tends to be high in our soils anyway. So typically you don't really need to add phosphorus. So those are outside the um, too much zone. And the other one is calcium. So before I learned which texts to read and which advice to follow, I heard that, um, read that chicken eggs are a good deterrent for slugs. And so for quite some time, I kept, kept, and, kept, uh, kept and crushed chicken eggs to use as a um, suppression device for slugs. Didn't work too well, but I ended up with a huge spike of calcium in my soils. On the other side, the, one of the key um, nutrients for, for plant growth is nitrogen. You can see that's in the very low range, as well as uh, potassium and sulfur. So this was very valuable for me to have this information. And down here, and all soil reports will have this, they'll tell you how much, which nutrients to add and how much to add. The challenging part, and this is a point that resources to help you with this if you go this path later, but uh, you have to do the math to find out like four point, what's 4.5 pounds of potassium um, per acre. So that, that, that's typically, so, let me put my glasses on and make sure I read this correctly. I think that's no, per thousand square feet. So again, you want to add the right amount. So that in, in, involves doing some relatively simple math, but you need to do the math to do it. Um, and that's actually blown out, uh, blown out here. And there's a calculator that WSU provides that shows you 
you you put the you put the values in and it's a handy calculator to say how much how many pounds of what kind of fertilizer are you going to need for um, amending your soils this made a, a couple of years ago when i i did this a while ago didn't really do the math didn't really get the results because i was guessing and a couple of years ago i was going to train the um night uh, the 2020 class of interns in um soils as part of as part of actually i gave this present this presentation to them and i figured i got to do the math because i'm not going to stand in front of them and say i don't know what the math is and i did the math and i've had the best since 2020 when i made these correct additions i've had the best crops in my beds that i've ever had because they were getting the right stuff in the right amounts okay so there's actually another kind of soil potting soil which oddly enough isn't soil at all. And I've included an excerpt from a um, label on the right to show you pot potting soil is a very valuable product for, for growing in, in plants, uh, growing in containers specifically because of its lightness and its, its drainage, ability to hold nutrients and its um, water retention. And it also doesn't have pests or, or weeds or other stuff like that in it, but it is one, almost 100% organic matter. And as I pointed out earlier, um, ideally you want 50% minerals, which could be silt, sand, clay in various sizes. So um, not only is potting soil sterile, as is listed here, but it's again, designed for the ability to uh, move it around and plant vigor. And so everything added there is to is to have it so it drains, holds water, and holds nutrients. The challenge is, and is that ultimately it turns into, if, if you did a soil test of a container, let's say five, four or five years down the road, it will be 100% organic matter, and almost none of the new. Uh, there'll be some nutrients, but it's going to be a challenge. This the stuff will compact. It won't. It will hold water too much. Won't have the pores you'd like. So realize that if you do use potting soil, ultimately it has to be changed out. So um, the, some of the options you have for um, soil mixes are to, you know, you, you can, if you're not gonna move stuff around a lot, make a mix of soil from your garden if you happen to have extra topsoil. And, um, but I will, I will warn you, that if you try take soil out of your yard, if you've got a newer yard, if you watch the construction project, the first thing that construction people do when they put up set up a new house is the term is remove the organics, which means all the plant life. Then they take the, the topsoil off to get down to a, a soil that a ground that will be easier to um, have a, have a plant a, a house built on that will stay in that place without cracking, the foundation cracking and stuff like that. But when they landscape the thing, they don't put very much topsoil back on there. So you're not gonna have a lot to choose from and you gotta work on building up your soils in newer, in newer developments, that's gonna be a thing. So you may wanna get amend with topsoil or buy topsoils, which can be done from a number of quality vendors. And you may wanna use potting soils, uh, potting soil as well. Anyway, the point is get the best soil you can for the best results you can. To till or not to till, that's the question. Um, Rototillers are a, a great example of a tool to really aerate the soil and um, build air spaces in between. The challenge is that they will go down as far as they go and take up generations of weed seeds that were in the ground before you, and you'll gar almost guaranteed have a bumper crop of um, weeds when you begin, uh, when you get the garden set for a little while. The object, is, so if you're setting up a new territory, you may have to, to may have to um, run to it just because it, it's too hard to, to do it by hand. Other than that, uh, the best recommendation is to only loosen soils if you've walked on them, driven over them, or in some cases, 
um, over the winter, if they're uncovered, the gardens are uncovered, the rain compacts them. And sometimes you need to recover that. And one recommendation for that is coming in favor is to never let the ground be bare, use something like cover crops, which double not only to keep the soil from compacting, keep the, um, the living organic matter, in other words, the microbes and other things like that, give them something to feed on during, during the off year, and also become fertilizer in the spring when you, when you till them into the soil. Okay, now that we've got our site selected and our soil prepared, now we move into how to select our plants. So um, starting here, this is a plant that I bought um, a couple of years ago, a market more slicing tomato. It's a, I selected it for a couple of reasons and I'll, I'll walk you through what those are. First of all, it's a very flavorful cucumber. And you see that it says maturity harvest about 60 days after transplanting. When you grow in the Northwest, ideally, when, whether you look at a plant label or a catalog or a seed packet, you wanna look at how many days to maturity. It's almost guaranteed 60 days will give you a crop. 70 days will probably give you a crop. Anything 80 and over, you're pushing your luck and you'd better have full sun 10 to 12 hours a day to get good results. So that's a, a, a key thing is to look at um, how long it will take to ripen. And we, we talked earlier about, it says full sun, that's the six, six to eight hours. Soil, is, as it's a standard. But it says, you can see there, it recommends a half a cup of organic fertilizer per, per plant. If you've fertilized correctly per a soil test, you don't need to make that additional um, add, but um, that's, that's a, a plan B for fertilizing to get good results for, for the cucumber. And again, I'd recommend growing cucumbers vertically for a number of reasons. And in this particular case, it likes, likes even, even soil moisture. And here's the, here's the other reminder we talked about earlier about um, going vertical. It says 40, 48 inches apart and a train to a trellis. If you train them to a trellis, you can, you can reduce that space a bit. So, um, and, and spacing, spacing is critical, which I'll talk about a little later. Here is a excerpt from a, car, a, a catalog, um, territorial catalog. And there's a number of, I, I like Territorial as one of the seed providers who does their seed development. In this case, it's down in Oregon, I think a little east of, of, of Eugene, where their seed gardens are and, and other, other places. So you know what's good for the Northwest. Um, Ed Hume Seeds is another one out of Puyallup. They, although they source seeds from other locations, they're all guaranteed to grow in our climate. But anyway, again, the same information I talked about earlier relative to, in this case, it, it lists a, um, uh, it lists all the characteristics you need for like um, what temperature it, it best starts at. So in this case, you need a warmer time of the year, how, how far to spa space them and thin them to, what the characteristics of the uh, ripened fruit are. And um, again, all the information that's on there. So. This is your roadmap to success if, when you learn how to read this and, and follow the instructions, because this is literally the recipe for that plant to grow ideally. And seed packets also contain that, that same information. So they're your guide. And in cases like a ter a territorial for sure, and some others, they list on their description what diseases these plants may be resistant to. As an example, I grow melons and I make sure I get the most because they tend to be longer season and need heat. They tend to be vulnerable to fungal diseases. So I make sure that I buy ones that are bred for greater resistance for those types of things. So this is a great opportunity to um, get, get a, great, a great start. I've, I've covered most of this. Um, and the, in the previous slides, it's to summarize, choose plants for the Northwest, what you want to eat, the size variety, know the time from planting to harvest, and choose disease resistant um, characteristics. And whether you buy seeds or 
our starts, something to read on the label is a little bit about the seed, especially if you want to save it. A F1 hybrid, there, there are great yields out of F1 hybrid plants, but you can't grow something, you can't save those seeds and get good results the next year. Open pollinated is the next order up, which is it will be uh, generation to generation, it'll give you the same plant. Organic is seed, seed stock grown organically and open pollinated heirloom is open pollinated with at least 50 yearly generations. So if you get heirloom crops from this area, you know they're, tr they're tried and tested and yield good results. So I'm gonna go into a little bit seeds starting next. The guard, so there's a gardening calendar and what you see there is an excerpt out of my gardening calendar and I'll walk you through that a little bit that, that I use the, the one on the right is, reminds me of a couple of things. Those items shaded in, in um, yellow are plants that need to be direct sowed into the soil and, and the range to do that. The ones un unshaded are, um, I, can, I can transplant and the ones in um, blue, I can, I can start as seedlings, but I gotta be sensitive to get them in the ground quickly because they don't last. The longer they stay in a, in a starting container, the more vulnerable they are to not being successful when they're transplanted. And for those ones, for the ones that have, where you um, have hot temperatures required like peppers, tomatoes, cucumbers, melons, pumpkins, et cetera, the soil thermometer is the ideal way of when to put them in the soil. And last year was an example of, of a challenge where I was successful in all my hot weather crops except melons because they needed the highest temperatures, almost 70 degrees at transplant. And no matter, I used every trick I knew in the book to raise soil temperatures at the three locations I was growing them. And they all got diseased and didn't make it. And I point that to, they got they had to go in the ground because uh, they couldn't linger in the in the start plant kit I started them in, but um, they didn't make it once they got into the soil because it was too cold. Other key steps to remember um, when you start: rotate your crops. Um, don't plant the same thing in the same spot year after year because the pest will find pest and disease will find that a shortcut to a, a good meal and and good luck for their next generation. Harden off transplants. What that means is, as an example, people who go from, are lucky enough to go to Hawaii at this time of year to vacation, if they go directly from Western Washington at this time of year into the tropical sun, they're going to fry. So they wanna harden off by limiting the, limiting the amount of sun they get for a while until their skin and and body gets used to that. Same with plants. If they start in the greenhouse, that's from, like from Hawaii moving here. They're, they're gonna be shocked and they're gonna be stressed. So hardening off means if you, if you bought them out like in a big box store or a nursery where they're already outside, they're going to be ready to be transplanted pretty quickly if the soil temperatures are good. But if they're inside or you're not sure if, if they've been outside very long, what that means is putting them out during the day bringing them in at night for five to seven days and then transplanting them. And I'll, talk, I'll give an example here about keeping the seedling plug and soil le moisture levels the same because that's so important. I'm gonna have a special slide on that. And then the key thing, there will be slugs, there will be pests. In your garden planting, have something prepared to deal with squirrels saying, oh, this is great soil to dig stuff in, cats, cats burying stuff, um, squirrels, or I should say rabbits chewing on it, be prepared to defend your space right off the bat. And then like this uh, label said earlier, there's an ideal distance for spacing, follow it. You can plant them closer, but you'll get less. So you can have one plant at one distance and get a full crop, plant two plants and get less, less amount from each plant, but you will we'll get a yield. I don't expect people to really get this, but they're I going to spend much time on this, but it is a, a standard rotation where you see what the plants are and you and you try when possible to um, rotate. So you don't, again, don't plant the exact same plant in the exact same spot year after year, 
try to move it around the best you can within the garden space you have. Okay. One thing I do for containers, since I grow basil in containers every year, is I take half the soil out and mix it with the one with the pepper plant I had in it, which is one way of rotating, not buying brand new potting mix, but rotating it between my pepper crop, which I have in, in containers, and basil. So this is fabulous artwork, I know, but the line is supposed to represent the soil surface. And the, the plant here, I think, is a looks like a broccoli plant. And you can see the roots there. So when you dig the hole, you want to have space where as loose a soil as you can. You don't want to have it be, have it be a snug fit in the soil. But it's absolutely important when you um, put the soil in to fill this hole that recognize that right off the bat, this plant will behave like it's still in the plastic pot it came in. And it'll take a while for the roots to go in, into the soil and get water from there. So you must watch this right off the bat to make sure it stays wet and the soil temperature, around, the soil moisture around it is roughly the same. And it'll take a couple days. I'd almost re recommend watering daily or every other day, every day if, it's, if you get hot days in there. So, so that this maximizes the chances of this not drying out and the roots beginning to expand into the adjacent soil. Other tricks you can use to get a good start is to use, uh, to raise the heat. Raised beds is one way we talked about. And, and these are a couple kinds of insulating structures, anything plastic and, um, and uh, I'll talk about a couple of these in the, for a second here. The, the first is that the plastic is gonna get hotter and, ve and ventilate least the row cover, and, but both of them keep away pests, so that's a good thing. The row cover is a little more expensive, a little harder to use, but it's, it's healthier, for your, healthier for your plant. Okay, so now we're moving into the sustaining step. We're nearing the finish, nearing the finish line. Again, I would, for the Northwest, I'd raise the heat in whatever, whatever methods possible. I showed two before, the mulches is one way, cloches, which means those plastic containers, row cover. Again, I use, I use big containers to raise the heat for the peppers and basil, which I put a, I've done experiments where I, I plant the same plant, same, dis, same place, basically one in a container, one not. The container basil and container peppers are dramatically better than the ones I plant in the ground every single year. We're gonna spend some time talking about the art of watering, limiting competition, which, is, which we've talked about a little bit and encouraging optimum pollination. Watering is actually an art and that's the, the hardest thing to do. And one thing, um, Bill Nye, the science guy, taught me this many years ago in, in an entertaining fashion. At first glance, which holds more water, a dry sponge or a wet sponge? The answer is a wet sponge right off the bat because of the, the property, the chemical properties of water that allow it to be absorbed faster where there's already some moisture than it is in a completely dry environment. That's why deserts, when it rains, it's been dry for months, years, decades and it'll run right off, right off the bat, because it's dry. Ideally, you want to use, in most gardening locations, prefer a drip method of irrigation um, than a drench method, but you can use whatever, whatever works. The recommendation is drip whenever you can set it up, and it's a little harder. Too dry, too wet. The symptoms for a plant that's too dry are almost identical for one that's too wet. And I'm gonna show you a graphic here in a second. And the other thing is to know the specific needs of your, of your crops. Like the label I showed you with the cucumber says evenly moist soil. That means at most let the soil dry to a depth of, of two, at most three inches before you, before you water. And the mantra for watering, Slow and low is best. And I'll, I'll give some science here in a second on that. So this um, graphic shows the consequences of too little, too much. Starting from the left, too much water kills the plant in essence, and water, water and fertilizer drip away is evidenced by these little dots here at the bottom. That's water being taken out by gravity percolation. Um, you can, 
with a little less overwatering, you can still have a relatively healthy plant and you're still wasting water and fertilizer because fertilizer is water soluble to be used by the plant. And if it's taken away by gravity, it's not available for the plant. The sweet spot, and there's a lot of variables on this, but the sweet spot is no water wasted in a healthy plant, too dry uh, kills it. So the, the key, especially in containers and, and seedlings, is to not let the soil get dry too deep. And that's, that's easy to say, but not easy to do. So I'm gonna give you some numbers here and, and say that um, knowing what your soil type is like will help you because sandy soils quickly, quickly put water to a depth of 12 inches, good loam, which means mixed with five to 10% organic matter, will take it six to, six to 10 inches relatively, it'll, it'll penetrate that deeply, which is very good penetration. And clay soil, it'll only go four to five inches um, because of the way clay absorbs water. The other thing to look at here is, I mentioned the time required, like sandy loams can take a half inch to three inches of rain, of, of water. So the thing to remember is if you're putting the water on soil faster than it can absorb it, it's just gonna run off. And so you're spending time watering, it's not gonna do it. So the slower you can put the water on, the better it is. And that's why drip systems are so good because they allow you, they, we can put it half a gallon or a gallon per hour, which is ideally slow. So again, just looking at that chart, you can see the difference is that um, from a half hour in good sandy soils to 10 hours in clay soils to get water. And if it's a dry soil, sandy loam takes, still takes four hours to get soaked to the right depth. Clay, as much as 120. So it's a bad, bad um, amount of time. This last chart on watering is, um, this shows you how the plant uptakes water. The number there on the side D means Plants grow very, roots various depths, and 70% is at the top half of their root depth. So you have you have the point is you have a margin of error, but recognize that 70% is um, at the top near the top half of its root depth. And in most plants, that's going to be two to three feet of, of root depth. So um, you can go what you can you have a, a reserve if you keep keep on your watering. The best way to, for a, lot, um, a number of plants need pollination, the best way to have pollinators around when needed is to plant, mix flowers in or have flowers or, or herbs near where you grow your vegetables because that will keep pollinators checking out that area for, for goodies. And when your vegetables, once it bloom for fruits bloom, there'll be pollinators nearby to help you out. Competition is as simple as it says, extra crop plants, weeds, they all compete for sun, fertilizer, and water, and you want to minimize their influence in your um, garden. Now, if you did all that, it may not, it may not be enough. So you, you have, um, might have to do something analytical and get some help. So WSU teaches a method called integrated pest man management, which goes through the following three steps. And this is kind of um, important. First of all is recognize when plants are threatening your, threatening your plants or your health or pests are threatening your plants or your health. The, um, not all damage is a problem. So that's, that's the first key. Monitor and identify the, the, the critters you have. Just because you see it in the daytime and there's damage on your plants, the damage may be occurring at night and the plants you see during the day, daytime are beneficials. So make sure you know what, what you have there and get help if you if you don't and confirm the idea of identification of the pest before taking taking action whether whatever form that takes and then the other pre premises of um, integrated pest management is choose the least aggressive first and I'll talk about what the, the details are but non chemical controls first and if you need to later on chemical controls so now. I'm going to tie this with the problem, the problem solving steps, identify the problem, look at alternative solutions, select an alternative, try it, see what, and then see what happens. Questions to ask as you look at your garden in the sustain phase is what plants are affected, what parts are affected, when did it start, how long has it been going on, is it getting worse? 
and what 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 are the what are the things you're seeing? Wilting discoloration critter bites. Um, you know, because it could be it could be a variety of things. Establish a time of year. So amount of sun is a, again is a problem getting worse. When we typically when we have our first really hot day in May or June, you'll see plants get sun scorched. And thankfully that's um, they, they quickly adapt to get sunburn just like we would if we were out that after a bunch of cloudy days, but it does get better. So the other thing to consider is, is the symptom actually a problem? And tomatoes, as an example, have leaves that curl. Nobody knows why, nobody really knows why it's happening, but it isn't a problem. It doesn't affect plant health or plant yield. Okay, so narrow down on what the potential causes were. And then very quickly, I'm um, going through these steps is sometimes to, no action is required and keep observing. Sometimes a change in gardening practice, knowing you're suspecting you're overwatering or underwatering, or your, the plants are too dense or haven't been weeded. Those are easy stuff, or treat the plant disease. So here's the non-chemical options for, for that. Cultural controls are don't let um, rotting stuff basically lie around your garden, rotate your crops, which we talked about earlier, good watering practice, which we talked about. In some cases, there are biological controls. Um, you can nurture them and you can, there's a, um, a bacteria, BT, that's, that's an organic critter, it's a bacteria. Recognize that um, you don't wanna kill all the, all the nasty insects because the beneficial insects will die off too. You want to kill enough of them to stop the damage, but not so many that the benefit of the of the pests come back before the beneficials can um, reestablish themselves. Other methods you can use that are non-chemical, you can trap them. Row cover is a great example. Our barrier um, is an example. Cardboard is an example of blocking stuff. A, a great thing to great thing to do is um, um, trap crops where they. It, it, Eat that some sometimes chrysanthemum is a crop that slugs will eat over vegetables. Row cover is a barrier. You can hand pick them. Aphids can be sprayed off with water. And when you get to needing chemicals, the recommendation is to go pest specific first. Therefore, that why that ID that um, ID is critical. And there are organic pesticides, meaning you can use them and, and still qualify as an organic gardener. Broad spectrum pests pest are method of last resort. There are still organic ones, but they tend to kill the pest as well as beneficial. So they're typically the last resort. What's a pesticide? It's any of a broad category of chemical agents. Herbicides kill plants, insecticides, insects, and, and et cetera. The most important thing after the ID is to read and follow all the label directions, specifically like you know, what time of day to use it, not to use it in the wind, how much to use for, for a variety of reasons, for your health, for your pet's health, or um, all the other life in your garden cell. And then find out that where the things got better. And you do, you do have resources to help, and I'll go more into the resources to help a little, a little bit later. So summarizing this the same step is take preventive actions first, use good gardening practices, practices to um, keep your plants alive and be a good problem solver if things show up that look like a problem. And we get to, we get to savor it. So this is a, pic, a picture of me um, in 2017 after I defeated some evil, um, well, basically it was crop rotation in the, the demo garden. We weren't rotating. And I finally got a, a crop of melons. I think this was 2017. And um, I'm delighted and I'm pointing out, yeah, I got some. But this is the, the easiest and most enjoyable part of the gardening. But there are things to consider about when to harvest. And that this is all to nurture yourself and satisfy yourself both physically and emotionally and a job well done and a plant and a crop that nourishes you. So on timing, here, here's an example. When I first demonstrated melons at the demo garden, my partner and I had learned that for cantaloupe, they're ripe when 
you pick the vine up and the, the plant stays on the ground and doesn't lift with the with the vine called it calls uh, fruit slip. Well, we grew watermelon and, and honeydew, and we found out when we came into the garden one day and there was this reek of sweet fruit that was beyond ripe, and we found that our honeydews and watermelons had rotted because they ripen. Signal they have is honeydews when the leaf nearest the fruit turns brown and watermelon, it's the tendril nearest the um, fruit turns brown. So the key is like in uh, an example, if you grow beans, you wanna get the, you wanna pick the beans typically before they start getting the bumps of the, the bee seeds because the plant wants to get the next generation out. It, it, it'll feed you as well, but recognize its prime job is to get the next ground, next round of seed available for dropping into the ground and, and nurturing it. So learn what ripe is for the crops you have so that you get the most sweet, most nutritious stuff you grow. And to summarize, uh, um, get and use a garden calendar, soil test recommendations, use a moisture meter, and most of all, have fun. So to finish up, I'm going to talk about the seventh S, support that there is support available to you on a number of levels. Like I said, I'm a master gardener um, and each of the master gardener organizations in each of the counties have demonstration gardens where you can see how we do it. You, we have plant clinics where we can give you personalized plants, plant advice. We have educational outreach. This is, a, this is part of our educational outreach and we can refer you to science-based publications. And, and we do need donations to keep this going because we're a nonprofit and we um, do this. So at this point, I think Megan will drop something in chat, which is a list of resources for King, Snohomish and Island County. And if you're not, if you're attending and aren't a member of, of those um, counties, then um, you can look that up on, on the web to find out your, your master gardener program for your county and find out where they have the plan advice clinics and demo gardens. So again, we're here to help. And I recognize I flew over a lot of material. And as an example, for those of you over three years, if this wasn't challenging enough for you, in two weeks from tomorrow, in our the King County Master Gardener Growing Groceries Program, I'll talk about the intermediate gardening, veggie gardening skills. So there are things that can take you deeper in each of these areas. Um, if you want to just learn, and, and you can talk to people too. So I encourage you to do that. With that, um, we're open for questions. All right, thanks so much, Jim. We've got quite a few questions. Um, I'm just going to start at the top and go right down through. Uh, first one is, how do you choose the best kind of soil moisture meter? There are some with one probe, two probes, long, short. What's better, or does it matter? It, it matters. Um, I, I recommend the single probe, which is for water only. They'll be glad to sell you pH and um, soil fertility, not soil fertility, but, but so, soil, yeah, soil pH is one. And there's a third probe, I can't remember what it is. But there's two things to remember about moisture meters. One probe is best, but when using them, use the um, measuring, uh, the, don't use the bulb end of it, because if you put it in hard soils, it'll jam into that mechanism. So take, take the probe and you hold the probe when you put it into the soil, unless you know your soils are really soft. And the second was, do not leave them in wet soils, do not put them in water, because they'll short them out. Because the, the battery is very short lived. So again, key, key things, 10 book dollars, gotta use them. Excellent, okay, great. The next question is about squirrels. Last two years, squirrels are taking over everything. Kales, lettuces, fruits, any tips on deterring squirrels and other critters from gardens? You did mention uh, things in your presentation, so. Um, I use, I use. Um, it, it turns out the squirrels are really only a problem at the starting stage in my neighborhood. And that's why I have, I actually have um, wire, wire fences that I, I are um, actually plastic one by one inch frame that I hang over hang over uh, frames that literally creates a, a physical barrier where I don't I use real cloth in some cases where I want a little warmth but I also use um, 
a plastic mesh to keep them keep them and cats and birds away from the plants. So there there are a variety of of, of barriers. It has to be a barrier to keep them away. I started okay. some sunflowers inside a guinea pig cage one year and transplanted them. <laughs> okay, but next, uh, it looks like someone's asking about using seaweed to add to soil. Uh, can you touch on what's the best to gather from the beach? I'm on Whidbey Island waterfront. Um, actually, I would have to do some research on seaweed. It's, it would be considered organic matter. The only thing I would consider doing is before composting it or adding it to wash it because salt is salt's a, danger, a threat to plants. Exactly. Uh, okay, next question is, how do your, you ensure you're buying good topsoil when you're buying in bulk? Um, that's, a hard, that's a hard question. Um, I would go a, reput a reputable buyer because I had a neighbor who learned the hard way. They, they bought the discount from some, some friend of a friend and the soil that was brought in contained a heap and help in of, of horsetail. Oh. Oh, so, that's just terrible. So, so gen generally, big companies like Cedar Grove, who who actually, um, in some ways, heat and sterilize their stuff through their composting processes, they're the they're the best bet. So, um, basically, do do pay attention to and ask ask for evidence of you know like who did you give sell soil to, so I can go see how their garden worked for them. Soil, yeah, soil is critical and. And some people harvest topsoil from areas where it contains weeds and other threats. Somebody's saying Cedar Grove and Everett is best for soil and compost. I don't know. Uh, the next question is, what are some good cover crops or green manure crops for bare ground, please? Um, crimson clover um, is, is one that comes to mind immediately. Actually, I'm going to... I'm going to do something here and share screen again. Okay, I'm going to share screen, and I'm going to make this somewhat somewhat self help here. Where did it go? Forgive me for stumbling around here for a second. Okay, this is the, and I'll put this in. If one of you can put this in chat, or I'll try to put it in chat. Okay, this is the Washington State University website. So some of the questions you asked, so the last one was on, um, um, Beth, what was the last question on? Ruth, excuse me. Oh, sure. It was asking for some good cover crops or green manure crops for bare ground. Okay, so. I don't know if you saw how fast I did it. Cover crops for home gardens west of the, of the, of the Cascades. So I'm gonna hopefully hopefully you're seeing this. Yeah. And so this is this is one of the things we do. So here's here's a cover crop document, and it says cereal rye, winter wheat, oats, annual ryegrass, barley. I, I came across a across, um, upon crimson clover. So the Typically, better better nurseries will um, have a section of cover crops later on in the year because you want to you want to plant them as your as your um, as your uh, as you transition from the end of your growing season to the winter for because they, they tend to grow over the winter and um, again save your soil keep it from compacting add nutrients. Great. Uh 
Next question is about seeds. Uh, how long do seed uh, packet seeds last? I inherited a load of packets when mom passed. Am I better off buying new as um, I am new to gardening? Okay, the, the answer to that can be found on the, on the uh, in two ways. First of all, each packet has a produced by um, our best, best our, our, should say packaged for this year. Most seeds are good for three, three or so years. If you keep them in the refrigerator, when, when you're not using, uh, except for when you get them out to plant them, they can go a couple more years. So I, I actually had tomato plants that, that um, a kind that I went back to after a couple of years, I think it had been stored in the refrigerator for six years and they were all viable. The way to find out is to take a couple right now, get a paper towel, poison it, get a Ziploc plastic bag, put the seeds and the wet paper towel in that, in that uh, zip, the Ziploc bag, put it in a sunny area, a sunny or warm area, and if they germinate in a period of time, they're ready to go. Excellent. Uh, the next question asks, what is the biggest difference between flower and vegetable gardens? It might have something to do with soil amendments. Um, 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 I'm not I, sure. Uh, I, in, in every one of my vegetable get, beds, flowers are mixed in, so I, I treat them interchangeably. I, I, the only difference is I, I tend to choose annuals. All of, I tend to have, my vegetables and flowers are both annuals. Ah, great. Um, does using a greenhouse help to shorten the time to maturity? It, it gives you better odds of getting getting it at, at that time. As, as an example, I'll use my melon crop, which I, which I uh, monitor quite actively. The biggest determinant is gonna be the, the weather overall. Most of the time in the Northwest, I get, I get the melons that I grow at, at trying to shoot for 65 days. The first, about the end of the first week of September. A couple of years ago, we had that really hot summer. I got them at the end, the end of August. So, same, same with tomatoes. Um, you, the time, the time is more, the greenhouse gives you a great start, gives you better odds, but the weather, the weather's came. I just have to ask you in the picture of the melons, I, sh I saw that there was black plastic underneath. Is that to just um, amp up the heat for those melons? Oh yeah. When I said I used every, every heat um, device on, on melons, I put Roca, I pre-warm the soil with uh, plastic, um, clear plastic in the spring. I use a raised barrel system that allows the water to be treated, uh, heated up so that it's as warm as the weather that day. So I use, I use drip irrigation that's been sun heated. I cover them with row cover once I transplant them. But after I take, when I take the clear plastic off, I put black plastic in when I transplant them. So I use every method to raise the heat. And that's, a, that's one of the reasons that I get success most of the time. This year was not one of them. Oh, wow. Oh, thank you. Okay, the next question is, can you recommend a place to purchase rain barrels? Um, there's a, a number of places, but they tend, I can't recommend a place. I know they're out there, but do diligence in shopping because some will charge you an arm and a leg for, for, the, for, the, for the rain barrel. And a hundred dollars for a rain barrel seems seems a little pricey. I know some communities actually have it, like Mercer Island. A couple of years ago, the ones I used at the demo garden, we bought them from Mercer Island, who was encouraging people to use them to lower the demands on on municipal water during the growing season. Cool. Oh, and I see somebody here. Somebody here said City of Everett had a rain barrel program too. So yeah, those are those are good options. All right, uh, you've emphasized the importance of crop rotation. What can you do to best raise perennial crops you cannot rotate, such as raspberries? Um, meet their, well, first of all, raspberries are, are, are fun because they're, they can be darn near weeds, they're so invasive. <laughs> the, thing, the, thing, the thing with that is you dedicate, you dedicate the area and recognize that they're, they're going to try to sneak out on you. So they're designed by nature to, to live in the same spot for years with the proper nutrition. That's, that's really the key, keeping, keeping on top of the nutrition 
and keeping them in the area you want them to stay in. So in, in some ways they're easier because you know what's going to happen. All right, thank you. There was a tip dropped in that said our local paper wasps are wonderful pest controllers. I give them places to build nests all around my garden. And then the next is uh, a question. Uh, slugs curse my garden. I have gotten up at 3 a.m. to pick them. <laughs> Any suggestions? Yes. Um, this was actually an elegant solution one of our master gardeners came up with. So before you plant, get some, uh, one example would be um, fence fence slats, the things you use for fences. So I think they're one by one by five or like that, or, or something wood, put it on the area where you're going to do face down, put a little, I use um, iron phosphate, some slug is an example of the product that has that under, under, under that, so the slugs are going to hide from uh, slugs are going to hide from the sun under the wood, and there's a song called Hotel California. You check in and don't check out. So they're <laughs> going to they're going to check in under that piece of wood, and they're not going to check back out. So you make you make it an inviting trap for them, and and you minimize the use of the pesticide. It's it's an organic pesticide, but you minimize the use of it and maximize the capture because they're going to look for the shade under that under that. And you can use that to help line straighten your rows up too. And it's a weed suppressant. What could be better than a, a triple <laughs> win? Excellent. Uh, next question. Uh, what makes up the pores of soil? Um, I think they're talking about the air pockets. Just, um, well, a, a, a standard example, we, as the, well, two, the, as the uh, uh, organic matter decomposes, it leaves a space as, as, um, when the, when the soil is naturally dumped, it's gonna it's gonna have air in it. That's just a, that's just a, a, a function of the beast. So uh, again, the key is to to, to not overdo that and just dist, dist, basically when you when you turn the soil, much of the soil, you actually kill kill the microbial growth that's trying to help you out in in that soil. That's why disturbing the soil is least, and they actually help create create air space too. Ah. Uh. Thank you. Uh, someone asks, could you please address the use of soil inoculants, uh, for example, for legumes? Um, they generally give a they, they generally give a boost. There, um, there's good there's good science to say they they can be beneficial in getting the plant growing underway because I think they get started. If I remember this correctly, the inoculants help the plant get a boost, so their growth gets ahead of the um, aphids which will come hunting for them later on in the spring looking for the ants will take the aphids up the up the thing so this gives this gives them a competitive advantage early in the season uh, or, it's the soil uh, peas are generally planted in cooler soil and the bugs in the soil haven't been converting the certain soil nutrients to be available for the plant yet so that inoculants give that a boost all right thank you Someone here asks, uh, what bagged soil do you recommend to use for filling raised beds? I don't, I don't, have, a, I don't have a firm recommendation. I am, I'm a slave to sales. So I will, I will look at Home Depot, Freddy's, QFC. I have an idea of what size I need and, and, and the like. But yeah, I don't, I don't have a particular, I have, I guess what's what's on sale and looks like reasonable quality is my favorite. All right, thank you. Uh, what about adding coffee grounds to my garden? My garden is a two by four foot raised container about two feet deep. Um, that's a that's a good um, addition for both as a compost and for adding carbon to the soil. It's not necessarily great fertilizer, but it can be added. And when I showed you that list of WSU pubs, there's a one one on. Um, Adding coffee grounds to soil, so you can, so if you do a search on WSU coffee ground soil, that document will pop right up. All right, you thanks. Can, see the WSU recommended way to do it because it's absolutely encouraged. Excellent. Uh, when do you plant cover crops? Um, in the fall, when you're done with the with the ones you want to want to maintain. Okay, someone wants. Tricks or tips for getting tomatoes to ripen? 
Um, this is going to be counterintuitive. Um, tip number one is, is when it gets late, mid to late July, you're going to want to do two things. First of all, clip off any new flowers on the plant. And on a branch of tomatoes where there's a bunch of varying sizes, um, you want to clip off the smallest fruits because they're not going to be much good for you anyway. And then you begin to cut back on its water. So this, this uses the plant's desire to want to get its seed to, in the ground for next year. So you actually stress the plant. You say, no, conditions are getting to the end of the season for you, buddy. So, and you signal that to, by those three steps, cutting off the flowers, cutting off the smaller fruits and cutting back on the water. And that's late July? Um, depend, depending on the, on the season, but yeah, typically late July, early, early August. Because, um, by that, by, by, yeah, by that time, the 55 and 60 day tomatoes should be ripening and um, you want to you get as many home as you can. Excellent, thank you. Uh, someone has a question on fungus. How do you combat the excess humidity here? My yard is mostly in shadow, thanks to 100 foot Douglas firs, and I've had apple scab as well as powdery mildew. I've read that a lot of fungal diseases can be exacerbated by moisture and I can't put a dehumidifier outside. <laughs> what would you suggest? I've been treating them with neem oil, but all my plants keep dying. Um. I'm going to invoke the mantra of master gardeners, right plant, right place. Um, the, po the point is you, you've identified the problem. My Doug firs have grown up to the fact that my apple tree is, I, I, get, I get stuff, but it's apple scab, pottery mildew, the, the, whole, the whole roster of things caused by lack of light. You can't, you can't, you can't beat that. So you, you go for, you go for cr uh, crops and stuff like that that can handle Shady, more shady conditions. And powdery, powdery mildew, mildew, because it's airborne, you almost can't defeat it in, in our climate because of the hot days, cool nights where, where moisture condenses in the fall and it's airborne. So it's gonna, it's gonna fly from plant to plant. All right, somebody wants to talk about starts and when to start them. Um, to, well, that, that's, that's where the planting calendar comes in. And um, give, me, give me an example and I can probably pull it off the top of my head. Mm. So as, as an example, lettuces, lettuces, I will start planting in, uh, are planting seedlings in late March, early April, to, to put in the ground late April and early May, because in my, in my garden, um, there's not enough light for them to get a good start until the first, first of May. You can also it, it, things like that. You can also try to self seed and, and um, see what see what takes in the ground. At the same time, at the same time you plant containers inside. It won't work for tomatoes, but leafy greens and like that. You can parallel plant plant the area, seed the area you want to grow them in. At the same time, you start the seedlings indoors. Typically, four to six weeks ahead of when you want to transplant. Thank you. Uh, someone covered says she covered my uh, I have covered my garden with cardboard this fall for the first time hoping to reap the benefit of it as a sort of compost it's not breaking down or it doesn't appear to be will it have broken down by spring or if not do I just end up throwing all the cardboard away or should I somehow try to rototill it into the garden um, my recommendation for that is to if you got your own compost pile, add it to your compost pile. You did a great thing by putting the, the cardboard on your bed because it, the rain didn't compact it. it. The cardboard let some of the rain through. So one of the, one of the challenges with cardboard is um, it actually acts as a mulch, but a hard mulch where it really doesn't let water and nutrients or sunlight through. And it takes several years to break down. Unless you put it in, unless you put it in an active, actively turned compost pile, and then it'll break down quicker. All right. Someone asks, why do tomatoes get mushy? Well, I, maybe I probably need a little more than mushy, because oh, the first thing that comes to mind is overripe. 
and some of the, some of them some of them get something at the end called blossom end rot, which is caused by inconsistent watering. And can, too dry, too dry, too wet, found often in Roma tomatoes. And sometimes that's a mushy part of the tomato, but I need a little bit more to make a more accurate diagnosis because I'm gonna guess, my guess based on the limited information is overripe. Okay, let's see, I'll continue on here. Uh, what is the best time of day to water? In the morning for three reasons. The first is that the pests will be going to bed and the sun will kill them if they try to linger out in, in the water. Second is the plants will dry off and the fungal diseases that, you, that we talked about earlier will be minimized because the leaves will dry quickly. The third is the soil is the coolest. And if you're growing hot weather crops, the soil will be at its coolest point in the day. So if you you had an 80 degree day and you put 50 degree water on it, if you water at night, it cooled the soil and given a shock to your tomato plant. So heat, disease, and pests are the reason to water, best water in the morning. Uh, what plants could we grow in winter in the ground or in a greenhouse? So again, there's a WSU pub on, on things you can do that. I, as an example, I start my garlic in, in, in October. Some of the leafy greens will grow. Um, as an example, um, charred kale are biennials. They, they grow robustly. First year, they, they kind of hang out in the winter and then will try to go to seed in the spring just in time to be replaced by the new, the new plants. So leafy greens are one good thing to, to, to grow in that way. There's a, those are the ones that come to, come, to my, come to mind right off the bat. Sometimes cabbages, and broccoli species can be over winter too. Thank you. Uh, somebody wants to know about tomato supports that really provide support. Um, meat rebar. <laughs> Seri seriously, get the thinnest rebar you can or some stiff rod, take the tomato cages they have and secure them from tipping side to side. So. I secure, you go heavy duty or secure them to the ground. Um, Cause they, they, will be, they will be tippy unless they're really well designed and or anchored into the ground. Excellent. This is an interesting question. Is there a way to compost kitchen scraps right in the garden instead of in a compost pile? Is that recommended? Absolutely not. It will. It'll do two things. It'll take a while. It'll take a while to um, compost because it, it'll take a while to compost. It'll take a long time to compost, and it will attract mice and rats and opossums and raccoons. Ah. Uh, next question: What seeds should we be uh, starting in the month of February? You could, depending on your location, you could consider direct sowing spinach and and peas excellent uh, we may get to all the questions we still got three left <laughs> i'm having trouble turning my compost pile any ideas and in parentheses go to the gym more <laughs> <laughs> um, well that, that's one way there's all, there's working working harder and, and 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 working smarter what what i've done as my especially um as age takes its toll and the composting, I tend to break up the chunks with a hoe and use and use a smaller bite of my um, pitchfork to turn it. So basically, take small more bites but smaller ones and break and break up the break up the compost because sometimes it mats together and makes these big, wet, heavy masses. Oh, the other thing to do is right now I would say cover it to keep any further rain off it. So because more rain will make it more heavy. And uh -huh. Covering it will mean less nutrients leached, leached out and lighter to turn. All right, thank you. Uh, someone says, I covered my beds with chopped up leaves in the fall. This spring, do I plant straight into the pile or do I remove them before I plant? Um, it's, it's, not, it's not a simple answer. You can... You can leave them there and kind of hold them down because what that will actually do is 
worms will come up and start pulling that stuff into the soil. But you're gonna, you're gonna want, so the risk of that is slugs will hide there. So, so that's a, that's a, 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 mixed, a mixed bag of risk and reward. The risk, the reward is if you, if you do it um, and basically hold the leaves down because when they dry, they'll start to blow around and like that. So holding them to the ground will help them compost faster, especially the, the activity of the worms and other things right between the interface of soil and leaves, but you will have slug eggs in there, almost guaranteed. So if you protect from slugs, you should be okay. Well, thank you so much, Jim. We've reached our time. And uh, so it's time to wrap up. I want to thank our audience for so many good questions. And uh, uh, just I've taken a ton of notes. <laughs> I'm planning wow. to grow a big crop. And I hope you are too, um, everyone that's out there listening. Um, be sure to check our events calendar for more events like this. Uh, this will this has been recorded and it will uh, appear on our Snow Owls YouTube channel in a week or two. Uh, but for now, I'm going to bid you all a good night and thank you so much. Happy growing. Thank you.